Phil, Thank welcome you. to the show. It's great Thank to you. have you back. Good to be back, yeah. Thank you. Sorry that I can only be here for 10 minutes or so. Um, That's okay. We'll be quick then. Let's cut to the chase. Um, okay. We have been looking back over the year, uh, 2012, and looking forward uh, a little bit to 2013. Um, we've been doing it more on um, a sort of like atheist religion sort of like level, but I really want to sort of like discuss science uh, now. Um, what for you were the scientific highlights of 2012 and what, if anything, do you see oh. happening in 2013? So I guess everybody would expect me to say, and of course I'm going to say the, the discovery or the Higgs. potential discovery of the Higgs, of course, but... Um, Actually, I'm a condensed matter physicist. I'm not a particle physicist. And I actually work very much at the boundary between uh, physics and chemistry. And for me, there were two key stunning experiments um, this year, uh, which, at least in my area of research and on my sort of day-to-day -day, uh, level uh, of you know, working in the lab, really, really inspired me. One of this was recently published in Science by the IBM Zurich group who work in atomic force microscopy. Not only now can they see the internal structure of molecules, they can actually image the, the charge density, the electron density due to bonds, effectively see the bonds. They can also see something called the bond order. So they can see variations in charge density. They can tell which particular molecule is more conjugated than another, etc. It's just fascinating stuff. Before that, um, in March, in just a, I would argue it's a sort of tour de force of atomic manipulation, which is the area I work in, m moving, positioning single atoms, single molecules, measuring their properties, bringing them together, looking at the interactions. Uh, um, Mano Haran's group at Stanford basically did this phenomenal experiment where they built up graphene by moving uh, or a gra the framework of graphene basically by moving individual uh, molecules around and they also distorted that lattice to mimic the effects of magnetic fields it's just uh, staggeringly good work so that's brilliant it's great about the Higgs but the Higgs is not the be all and end all the problem is like I get oh I don't know I'd say at least once a week maybe twice a week I get emails saying, well, oh, they've, you know, it's probable that they've discovered the Higgs. Does this mean the end of science? No, it, it, it really doesn't. So it's, um, it's great that they've done it, but from some aspects it can be a little bit frustrating when, you know, everything is, well, we found the God particle now, time to shut everything down. It's, it's a little bit <laughs> irritating. I, I, I can't believe that people actually say that. Um, I mean, what do they think? That this is the... Well, it's, it's, the, 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 the um, holy grail of, of science and that's it once we found yeah, that everyone can put the all the scientists can put the feet up and say ah we've done it all now but to be fair you know there are many physicists who have helped to you know foster that particular um oh i don't know concept in terms of we talk about a very grand unified theory we talk about the god particle etc etc and we just need this final piece of the puddle and puddle puzzle and everything will will, will fall into place and um, of course it's not like that. In fact, much of the more interesting stuff, uh, we haven't got, I hope we haven't got any particle physicists um, watching, I've, um, particularly colleagues in Nottingham, but um, there's, there's a vast world of science out there that does not relate really to the, the, the Higgs. And it's, it's almost heretical for a physicist to say that, but for me, I care about the electromagnetic force. I don't that, care. I mean, in, that, in that sense, you're right. Do you these exceptionally high energy, uh, short time scale experiments are just completely out of the realm of day to day energies. You know, these are things that essentially never happen. They're of relevance for the standard model, they're of relevance uh, for uh, early working out what would likely have happened in the early universe. But you're right that in terms of things that actually work into technology, and make our lives better, the discovery of the Higgs is almost no relevance. Yeah, yeah, let's perhaps, so I'm, as um, DPR knows, I'm a, a very much a proponent of, of fundamental science, and as Concordance knows, um, uh, that, you know, there's a, there's a reason we do these things in, that doesn't necessarily have to couple into a technological development, so it's dangerous to go down that path. Um, but, yeah, the the... The, the difficulty, I think, is that we oversell, and in my area it's happened as well, nanotechnology was sold 
and continues to be sold as this wonderful panacea that's going to cure everything, it's going to be this technological bullet that's going to solve all our problems. And that's a society, that's a very bad way for scientists to behave. Um, you know, if we get this one thing, if we get this next piece of funding, we can solve this and everything will be cured. And to an extent, you know, CERN, Higgs has been, you know, the funding for CERN has been has been driven by the Higgs. That is not to say, and I really don't want to, 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 to put across the idea that I think that the Higgs is not important. Of course it's important. Of course the idea of what's the, you know, what's mass fundamentally um, uh, is... Is, is extremely important, but um, as I said, it's not all of science. I mean, yeah, don't, don't get me wrong. Um, when I when I, with what I was saying, I understand how it could have been misinterpreted. I mean, uh, for certain, the discovery of the Higgs is an absolute tour de force of uh, technology and understanding of of physics. Um, you know, to accelerate whatever it is. Um, it's it's protons, yeah, mm -hmm. to to the point where their effective mass is something like five hundred. About right. Of about that order, yeah. Um, Base. yeah, uh, the, uh, you, you know the sort of precisions that you got to work with here um, are oh, impressive. Yeah. Um, Absolutely, and the detector technology, etc., is just out of this out of this world, and um, of course we've got it. We've got to keep striving. But, you know, is this reductionist approach really the best way to go? You know, I, I've, you look at biology and it's, it's always a question of the, you know, the something being greater than the sum of the parts. And we've been driven in physics by, and I, I guess we still continue to be to a very large extent, you know, reducing it down to the basic components of the basic components. But in many cases, it's when you... When you look at the nonlinearities, when you look at the complexity, you know, chaos theory is a very good example. You, 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 from very simple systems, such as, for example, a simple pendulum, if you drive that in the right way, you get this incredibly complex behavior. And I think for many people, that sort of development of um, interactions, the development of um, different types of couplings between different aspects of a system, is perhaps, and Oh, how can I best describe this in non-scientific la language? Just a question of sort of communities and um, interactions between different objects is perhaps a little bit more um, exciting than actually breaking. We take and we pull, take an onion and we pull off one shell and we break it down, we break it down, we break it down, we break it down, down etc. And I think a lot of people are coming around to the idea that um, maybe this reductionist approach is not just the only way. I know biology is going through right now the, the, the beginnings of <clears throat> that reverse trend. So synthetic biology, this, this creation of organisms sort of de novo from uh, DNA. We create an organism, you know, laugh evilly and, and the lightning bolt strikes and everything. But you can, you can put that cell together and learn how the programming works. We've spent all this time tearing apart genes and DNA and epigenetics and all the forces that go to shape how the cell performs. And now the task is to begin to synthesize it back together again and find what we didn't discover by tearing it apart. Um, we're also seeing things like system of biology, which, which draws from multiple disciplines within biology, within molecular biology, uh, to try to understand problems from eight different angles at the same time. Uh, and the kind of people that you see going into systems biology are very different than the standard molecular biologists. They have an entirely different approach. Um, a lot of them have what, what I would consider to be like a five-year research plan. They, they plan on where they're going to get, you know, year two, year three, year four, because mm -hmm. all of the, the analytical work's already been done. They've already, again, the reductionists have already been out there and torn it apart and, and discovered what parts go into these different things. And then it's up to a different type of scientist even, a different, uh, entirely a different approach. And that's why the last time we talked, uh, Phil, is we, we talked about this big science versus small science. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to be a small science project and do reductionist analysis because you can tear it down to the single subunit. But when it comes time to synthesize across eight different disciplines, you need a program project grant. You need a, you need a, a 
five-year funding cycle. You need uh, multiple PIs. You need lots of different collaborative efforts so in order to bring that critical mass in. Yeah, I don't want to revisit that, but I guess I think there is. I think you brought up the last time that there is evidence to show that, at least in the, the biological or biomedical sciences, that those large grants win out, or those large program grants win yes. out over the small investigator. I don't yeah. believe that exists for physics, not in the, certainly not in the UK and, and not in the US. And, and physics is a very different beast. Um, um, we've obviously interdisciplinarity is key, but one thing that's that's forgotten about a lot. Um, is the the overlap between experiment and theory? It's still very common for theorists and experimentalists sort of to work as separate units and sort of meet up once a week or whatever or twice a week. But it's it's and still very very rare to find a postdoc or to find a PhD student who's working on both experiment and theory. Certainly in my area, so which is condensed matter physics, surface science, nanoscience. It, it tends to be you have the theorists separated from the experimentalists. And I think getting those people to communicate, even within a single discipline, is just as important as having the sort of large multidisciplinary um, uh, teams working on this. And the other, the other thing that, that worries me about the large multidisciplinary teams is that when you bring these large centers together, and I'm not going to mention names, but there's certainly been the case in the UK, in many cases, you bring these large centers, very well-known places um, together. You have multidisciplinary teams, very large numbers of, of people, and a certain level of complacency builds in, particularly if you know that center is supported for five or ten years or whatever, um, and that that can be on on health. Yeah, the, the, there is a happy balance there between too much security and too too little security. Indeed. Um, yeah, you, you're right. You, you give people too much security and uh, they become complacent. But if you don't give them enough security, then they will never start on the important big projects. Yeah, and my, my big, biggest bugbear at the moment, we're coming up to this research um, assessment exercise, research excellence framework here in the UK. And my biggest bugbear is that what we are ranked on as academics at the university level, at the faculty level, and also at the national level is how much grant income you bring in not your efficiency in terms of how many papers have you produced per um, dollar or per pound invested. It's have you brought in X numbers of dollars per year? And that's the key metric. And that's a really stupid way to judge people where you're judged on your inputs in terms of securing funding rather than on you know either your outputs. That, of course, is uh, an aspect of the assessment process. Yeah. But the key metric should be how much output have you delivered for a certain amount of input. And remarkably, that's not the case. They can always game that, though. You can always game a ratio like that. It's much harder. You know what I mean by exploit? Yeah. You can exploit mm -hmm. the, the weaknesses in the system. I mean, like this, is the, this is the Bottom thing. Once you, what, yeah, what you, your concordance is right. Once you come out with any metric, you can always game it to your advantage. Yeah, but the um, metric at the moment is, um, you know, in certain places like Queen Mary, in London, for example, a very, very high, well, reasonably high profile case, certainly here in the UK, where they were hiring and firing, sorry, firing people on the basis of what was your grant income, what journals had you published in, in terms of the impact factor, where effectively was your name on the author list, and a stupid algorithmic um, summation of all those different items. And, um, you know, for, we, we are increasingly forced to use these stupid metrics, but, you know, some metrics are even more more stupid than others. What what do you see um, in 2013, or, or maybe just generally in the future, as being the next significant breakthrough um, in uh, science? I mean, you mentioned, for example, that nanotechnology was considered to be the, the next, or previously had been considered to be the next great breakthrough that was going to resolve all sorts of problems, um, but perhaps it isn't. What, where, where do you see the future lying, so to speak? I think so. I think nanotechnology's a star is sort of in the descendancy. I think Concordance would probably agree with me that the next big thing or the next buzzword is synthetic biology, artificial life. Would you would you agree that that's something that's going to grow? Absolutely. In yeah. 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 And I well, think. Could you, I think could you just for the sake of ignorant people like myself and perhaps a couple of the audience as well who may be as thick as I am, um, what that exactly means? 
It is, as it says on the tin, um, can we have basically abiotic life? Can we have sort of non-carbon based life? Or can we have, um, you know, can we sort of reprogram cells? Can we muck around with the, the, the genetic um, machinery? I say, what, are we necessarily restricted to carbon and what, what, what exists beyond that? And um, certainly for me, those are, those are fascinating areas. For me, one thing that I'm really keen on in my particular area, uh, by the way, concordance, I'm sure, can expand on, on those rather um, naive physicists' ideas there. Um, one thing I'm really keen on is, is, to move, is to move towards something whereby instead of what we do now when we make a material or we make a, an assembly of molecules, is that we sort of trial and error, process these things, throw some molecules down, see that they form some nice pretty patterns, investigate those and then try and, and see what the properties are. Wouldn't it be great if you could dial in a property and then set the system up so that it evolves? Okay, you might have to prod it with different electric fields or different um, flows of chemicals or whatever, but say that what I want is a material with this property. And then you use some type of evolutionary strategy, genetic algorithm, whatever you want to call it, to, to, to get the system to move in that direction. And, you know, there are a couple of labs in the U.S. that are moving along these lines, one or two labs in Japan that are also doing this, but it's not that widespread at the moment, and I think that's a fascinating area. But again, this is Concordance's um, stomping ground rather well, than... Well, uh, the pressure's on you, Concordance. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it is. It's one of the biggest things, and it goes in two directions. The physicist, of course, is interested in the, the, the basics, the... Um, uh, how do these molecules interact, yada, yada. And that's the work that's currently going on is, is can we understand enough of how nature creates these programs in order to replicate something custom built for that purpose? Mm -hmm. what, what most people don't think about with synthetic biology is there's actually, and this goes back to our initial conversation, has an enormous commercial potential. Uh, you know, everyone's a little skeptical about that right now, but ultimately you could build bacteria to do something for you. You can, you can design bacteria to make ethanol out of uh, uh, plant wastes. You, I you, was you afraid can... you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> there are all sorts of things that we're currently constrained by what we can do with existing organisms and, and cramming a gene into them. Uh, but we can now say, what if we built it from the ground up? What if we took just the most basic operation uh, within a bacterial cell and we started adding additional things? What if we could program in clonal mammalian cells to make a liver, uh, to make uh, a modified liver, to replace um, parts of the, the brain in, in Parkinson's? Uh, so there, there are a lot of potential applications once we understand that we can reboot a cell that we can we can scoop out the DNA that's in there and put new DNA in and have it follow a completely different path um, there's a lot of applications for that and the fact that there are immediate applications makes it much more commercially viable which means more support from sectors outside of, of the National Institutes of Health yeah. uh, so I think we'll see a very very rapid progress in that field the other field and I'm just gonna throw this in is next-gen sequencing it's it's freaking amazing what we can do now with next-gen sequencing um, sequencing DNA you all know the original human genome project took a really long time and cost uh, billions of dollars uh, and that same operation can now be done in really a day uh, for for about three to five thousand dollars a whole genome uh, depth of four or five times, each, each base being read four or five times. Uh, probably within two years, we'll have the $100 genome. Wow. Uh, and you'll be able to do it in, in, a, in an hour or two. And now you're in Gattaca territory. But there are a number of applications for that as well, far beyond what most people think of, you know, prenatal screening and forensics. There are a number of applications where people can say when they show up at the hospital, uh, be treated a certain way based on you know, this is the whole personalized medicine uh, option. The number of other things, next-gen sequencing as a technology though is advancing faster than anything I've ever seen in my lifetime. It's truly so, astounding. I, mean, I, I would just add one, uh, I'm all with you on the uh, medical applications. The one that I 
I raise an eyebrow at is using microbes to break down cellulose, uh, yeah. essentially to turn trees into ethanol. And that's uh, the, the the cynic in me says that bacteria and the such like have had four and a half billion years to work out an effective way to metabolize cellulose and they've come up dry. So I think you we've already have a reasonable idea that there isn't um, uh, that that a large part of the landscape has been explored and it's not got anything it didn't it didn't get anywhere um so i mean i mean i'm i'm skeptical on on that side and also it's one of those things that even if you could work out um convince bacteria that would digest cellulose very quickly this is probably the last thing that you would ever want to create given that this is a, a planet destroyer you know you, you get this out into the wide world and um yeah, those those are genes you don't really don't want to create if they exist at all. If I can just, Richard, just one thing, stepping back to physics for one second. One thing I should have mentioned that what I was really, really happy to see was that the award of the Nobel Prize, although many in last year in physics, although many people thought it might very quickly go to the Higgs, um, actually went to fundamental discoveries in in quantum mechanics. And that's just, again, I'm just touching back on something we discussed the last time I was on the show. There well, are I gave, so I gave you the opportunity then, Phil, to explain to the audience um, all about quantum electrodynamics, and you seemed reluctant to take up that In five minutes. <laughs> well, I gave you five minutes, yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what I, I, I think the fundamental... Sorry, is, go on, Richard. Is, is it possible for you to tell us what the um, new discoveries were? So, yeah, no, the, the new discoveries are fundamentally about trapping single particles, um, photons basically and electrons, and looking at the interactions between those. And um, they, they fundamentally looked at something called entanglement, which I, get, I did mention the last time around, and that remains the unsolved and the big issue um, in, in quantum mechanics um, is, you know, if you get two, two particles, um, you can set them up in a state whereby, without going into the details, um, you can send one particle to one end of the universe, the other particle to the other end of the universe. They mean they, they um, retain a coupling, which is called entanglement. And if you make a measurement on this particle over here, this one responds instantaneously. It's what we call superluminally faster than the speed of light. And there have been a number of experiments along the lines of those which the Nobel Prize was won for this year, um, stretching back to the 80s, and um, that have you know, shown that this remarkable spooky action at a distance, as Einstein called it, holds. And we just don't have a clue. There was something fundamentally lacking in our understanding of space-time and our understanding of how um, what the, the essence of, of, of the, the, the wave-like nature of a, of a particle is. And that, that's been something that's been hanging around for the last century. And I don't think it's going to be solved in 2013, but I hope that the award of the Nobel Prize last, last year will give a bit more impetus to those types of, of studies and certainly get a bit more funding flowing towards fundamental um, or experiments designed to, to, to really probe the fundamental aspects of quantum mechanics without having one eye on the sort of technological discoveries. I, I, have, I have an offer, offer for you then, Phil. Um, I appreciate the time you said you'd give us 15 minutes, you've given us 25. What I'll do oh, okay. is invite you to come back and join us uh, on a show next year when we can actually have more time to spend on that. I'd love uh, to, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, we look forward to that. Um, but uh, as I say, I, I know that um, your time is restricted. Can I just thank you very much for joining us on our Magic Sandwich Show Christmas special? Thank and you. As I say, I will be in touch with you and um, uh, get you booked in for sometime next year. It's excellent. Christmas. Happy New Year to you all. Great pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. Happy Phil. New Year. And a thumbs yeah. up, please, from the uh, audience for uh, Phil's time. Uh, don't matter. Uh, how long does it take you to make your videos? Because, I mean, they're, they're incredibly intricate. Oh, thank you. Um, it depends, really, on how much of how much material I've already made that I don't... Like, if, if I have a lot of new characters or new scenes that I have to draw, 
then it'll take a while. It'll take as long as, you know, two weeks. But if I'm, if I'm doing a, a video where I had already drawn everything, you know, I got God and Jeffrey say they're going to be the main characters and, you know, it's just going to be mostly a background of like heaven or something, then I can bang one out in a couple of days. And you do all the voices yourself? You do Jeffrey and God? Yeah, yeah, I just change the pitch and the speed a little bit. I think I think Mrs. Dark helps out on a couple of characters. Um, but um, that was one of the questions I was going to raise with you as well, uh, given your sort of like background, given what you've told us before about it. Um, obviously, there must have been something that uh, motivated you to start doing these videos. Um, what was that, and what message do you think you're? Oh, that sounds awfully patronizing. What message are you trying to get across uh, in doing so? There was. It's it's tough to say. Uh, the the cartoons in particular, I it was never any grand plan. But um, after seeing you know non stamp collector and and being so, yeah, you know I was very impressed with with him. And I thought, well, you know, I've, I've a better artist. I could, I, I don't, I didn't think I could match his wit, but I thought, you know, maybe I can um, do some a little better animations. So that's when I started learning how to. I'm all self-taught with the animations. I just read the tutorials and, and you know, figured it out on my own. And I um, oh, started. What do you actually use to animate? It, uh, it's a co program called Anime Studio Eight. Right now, I'm using most of my videos were done with the non-professional version, but I recently upgraded to the professional version, which is well worth it. So, um, and roughly, how much does that cost? Um, the professional version, I think, was 150, but most of my animations were done with a 50 dollars version, um, cool. which is well worth it, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, I, I, I mean, I hadn't, I never expected to to be you know for anyone to actually watch them I, I I've always I always liked doing little you know skits and bits and stuff and I always and I and I did that even when I didn't have an, a big audience you know I like I always loved making people laugh you know my, whether it was my family or friends and I would I would do little stand-up bits in front of them sometimes and in and, and you know YouTube kind of just filled that gap in my life very nicely because then I got this audience this huge audience that i never expected to have and and i got to you know do these these little comedy routines that actually not only are they you know fulfilling my wish to make people laugh but they're also something that i'm very passionate about and that's you know uh, debating about about religion and, and the existence of god what what sort of feedback do you get from them? Do you, do you get um, lots of YouTube messages, sort of like saying, "Wow, thank you, um, you've made me think and um, changed my opinion"? Or uh... most of my messages are overwhelmingly positive, which uh, it's kind of the opposite of what I expected. I when I was a smaller YouTube channel, I got much more hate mail than <laughs> when I than when I became a Big, bigger YouTube. I think I got almost, I think nearly 80,000 subs now. And um, back when I had, a, a, you know, a couple thousand, I got I got more hate mail than I do now, which you know. I... <laughs> and the 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 gist of the hate mail: death threats, or just you're a wanker, you're going to burn in hell, or. I got a I got a death threat, um, from a Muslim guy, who. Uh, he was going to um, cut off my mother's head, um, burn her body, piss on her ashes to put out the fire, and then burn the ashes. So she's going to be dead. And um, so, so, so a mild threat then. <laughs> yeah. And um, but hang on, but, hang on, hang on a second. What I don't understand. This is a religion of peace. <laughs> no, it's it's only. Peaceful to other Muslims, DPR. Well, that's not hey, that, that does, right. doesn't extend to non-believers' mothers. But I mean, did, did did this sort of like uh, threat concern you, or did you just think no, it was a joke? No, no, I, it didn't concern me. Um, I, you know, someone, I, I, 
tend to think that if someone were really serious about doing something, the last thing they would want to do is warn me about it. But um, the, uh, the, a year later, though, after I got that death threat, the same guy um, contacted me again to apologize and to tell me that he was no longer a believer. Wow, you're kidding. <laughs> No. Yeah, I, I I can see why you might feel guilty about that, but I, mean, <laughs> I, I I'm very much with you that. Um, but you've got to be a little careful with this. Um, you know, whilst there is this element of the dog, the barking dogs are not the ones you have to worry about. It's the ones that will just come up and bite you are the ones you have mm -hmm. to worry about. And whilst I would agree that um, it does seem very stupid to actually write a death threat to someone telling them what you're going to do, you know, that's like so professionally stupid. Can anyone be that dumb? Um, but then again, um, if it, the people who are going to carry this sort of thing out aren't sane and normal anyway. So you have to be a little bit careful about um, assuming that they work on some sort of sane and rational basis. Well, they want to see but, you squirm, yeah. right? The point is terror. I mean, the point is to, to scare you. Uh, to show that they have power over you, right? And that the the real purpose of death threats yeah. is is the. But the I mean, threat. I I just I I can't believe that anyone would be so stupid. But then again, I, I know there are lots of stupid people out there. But to send you death threats over the internet because everything is traceable once you do it over the internet, and if you're going to actually um, start sounding credible people will take the effort to track it back. Well, let's not be gloomy. It's a season of goodwill. Um, so rather than dwell on death threats, uh, let's take our next caller. Um, after Image. Welcome to the show. Hey, everyone. What are you bringing to the table? I'm hoping you can hear me. We can hear you perfectly, yeah. Excellent. Um, well, firstly, I'll get out the... The quick things, um, thank you to everyone that's here, that, uh, all the great work that you guys do. Get all the brown nosing out of the way, as promised. Um, DPR, love the work that you do. The MSF thing is always a great event. I've, yeah, this is the second one I saw for 2012, and they're Thanks fantastic. Much, Thanks for all your hard work. Concordance, love your videos. Can't wait for every time you get one up. I'm sorry you've had some trouble this year, but yeah, I'm always bad at breath. I'm always getting people to watch them. Thunderfoot, you got me started into all this stuff. Your Why People Are for Creations, this is one of my favorite series. Keep putting me out if you get a chance to. In Dark Matter, you're hilariously funny. And I, again, wait for your stuff. So thank you, all, everyone, for your work. That's very thank kind you. of you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Now that we've got that out of the way, um, look, what I really wanted to ask about, um, I mean, we talk a lot about um, um, conflicts between what the Bible says and what we know about the world, blah, blah, blah. I wanted to look at something else, something about uh, where, where NASA and a lot of space organizations going is looking for signs of life or life or, you know, we, we we're in a, an age where we know exoplanets and everything like that. Um, the question is, is that if there has life has occurred anywhere else, we're getting closer and closer to the day, we'll discover something about it, uh, whether traces of it, extinct traces of it from Mars, Maybe even microbes on Mars. Maybe there's some somehow some of it survives somehow. Um, you know, they, they talk about um, I think it's Io. Um, we're now seeing th um, plants away, and they're talking about detecting atmospheres and working out you know chemical reactions. So possibly see the signs of what we'd expect for life. Um, and, and I guess in the short future, I guess there's always a promise that perhaps we can do better and start traveling more more than just sending probes away in the solar system. Yeah, in the next couple of hundred years, it, it's quite possible that will have the understanding of the universe where we can even start to travel and, and live like something out of a, a sci-fi that we all, well, a lot of us love. So I guess if that happens and we do discover life as it seems like it's, at least on, on paper, a, a good possibility that eventually we will, assume we don't kill ourselves, how will that affect religion? Will it um, remove old religion? Will it... Um, do you think it will impact at all? Will it depend on what we find? Like if we find just traces, people will have cognitive difference go, eh, it means nothing, or whatever, or will it actually will, pe will it actually make effect and change people's years? Anyway, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on it. You know what would be funny is if we landed and there were like crosses and cathedrals and little green men walking around with like a, a alien Jesus on the cross, I, th I think that would be awesome. But I don't think it's likely, right? So if we run into, let's say, intelligent, sentient life, 
uh, with culture and civilization somewhat comparable to ours. And they didn't believe in the exact same religious beliefs that we do. And why the hell would they? Uh, our own people don't believe in exactly the same thing. It would be pretty obvious to me at that point that ours is a very colloquial religion, right? That, it, that it's only something that we've come up with, and only some of us have come up with these things. But nothing's going to shake the faith of, of people who depend on religious belief for their, their very value systems, for their, their belief in themselves is somehow based on the fact that they're a, a special snowflake that God created, and God wants nothing but good things for them no matter what horrible thing happens. So I, I don't think it would have a real effect um, if it's something as simple as bacteria. And, and I actually think that kind of thing is quite likely. And the reason why I think it, it would be quite likely, if suitable planets are available, uh, what we know about our own planet is that life arose almost immediately in geological terms after the planet was suitable for life. So the processes that occurred occurred again on a geological scale, very, very rapidly, uh, which to me means that they're probably quite probable in this universe. Um, okay. Uh, a couple of things. First of all, if we do actually get uh, sufficiently technologically advanced to go to other planets, um, it's not unlikely that we will still have this huge disparity of, yeah, I mean, even now, we have on this planet people who will go witch hunting and will actually kill what they think are witches in and we also have walking around on this planet people with iPhones so even if we could get this technology um, to go to other planets I think it's um, unlikely that they'll, they'll, I think it's very likely that religion will all exist in in some way shape or form um, I would be a little more, uh, I think, uh, skeptical than concordant about life on other planets um, for the, the, the current re this reason. Um, yes, it's true that life on Earth arose almost the, as soon as the conditions were suitable, you know, million years or something. Um, however, you have to bear in mind that the Earth... Um, had really quite a lot of energy around. Um, you know, for life, you do need to be able to make and break chemical bonds. So you do need this uh, range of temperatures. Um, and on Earth, you have that from uh, lightning, you have it from the sun, and you have it from the uh, geothermal energy. You go to places um, like Europa, and you don't really, whilst it's true that you may well have liquid water there, um, I'm not so sure there is the the energies go high enough to get you the bond breaking um, uh, type energies that you need uh, to get self replication and therefore the possibility of life. And I think that um, it could. It could affect religion in two very different ways. Um, the the type of religious thinking that says you know human beings are the are the reason for for the universe to exist that you know we're the center of it all. Um, you know they're going to have a rude awakening. On the other hand, um, suddenly it looks like you know it gives strength to the argument that you know the universe was created specifically for life you know if we find that hey life doesn't just exist on earth it exists everywhere then all of a sudden the universe isn't so inefficient as it seems right now or you know it could give strength to that side as well so maybe a stronger argument for deism a weaker argument for uh, more I, I religious would... I would still absolutely, I mean, it's one of those things, the only place that we know that life can exist is on the surface of planets. Right. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that, that basically 0% of the universe, I mean, it's 0% of the solar system. In fact, even on the planet, the, you know, the fraction of the mass of the planet that can actually support life is almost nothing. Um, and even um, 
just solid matter itself is it's kind of rare compared to the universe, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. I just just for a point of clarification, uh, a, a vast majority of the surface of Earth is suitable for life. It's just that only a very very small fraction is suitable for human life. Because uh, there's bacteria freaking everywhere. There's bacteria miles down into the Earth's crust. There's uh, bacteria growing in, in Antarctica. There's bacteria, so far as we know, are the only terrestrial colonists. The only Earth colonists are bacteria which were, were recovered from the lens discarded by Apollo 11. Uh, so there are still probably plenty of bacteria on the moon. And... Uh, in spite of everything we do to avoid it, there are quite probably bacteria on Mars right now. Uh, they're doing a much no. better job than we are. Sorry. No, what, was, what was that about Apollo? Yeah, the, the uh, Apollo 11 uh, astronauts took a camera and some of the materials were, were left behind uh, for payload reasons. And they did eventually go back and recover some of those uh, in, in future missions. And they discovered uh, bacteria that had survived on the inside of a lens mechanism uh, on one of the cameras. And it had been on the moon for, I don't know how many years, uh, I, several I, I years. Th I think that Surveyor 3 and Apollo 12. Is that and what it was? Second, okay. The, the yeah. second Apollo yeah. landed almost on top yeah, you know, it was meant to go there, but it landed very near one of these um, previous lunar lander things. Yeah. But every time they, the, they send something to another planet, another another satellite, um, they're bringing along with them. That they're doing their absolute best to get rid of everything. And I've, I've been to the facility at NASA where they do decon. I uh, am they have, so envious of you for that. It's awesome. <laughs> they have the 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 low pressure uh, right so where they evacuate right everything. They have the the hard vacuum. We were we were actually doing some testing there, so I, I can finally talk about the fact that I was a consultant for NASA on some equipment that was to go on the International Space Station. No longer been funded, so I can talk about it freely. Uh, we were going to put uh, some PCR equipment, uh, polymerase chain reaction, uh, biological Xerox machine. Uh, we were going to put the equipment on the International Space Station. And so we were doing the feasibility testing on, on various smaller units, uh, pre-launch prototypes, uh, and running them through the, the hard vacuum chambers, the decon chambers, uh, what their response was to humidity, and you know, all the different micrograv type simulations. Uh, was it was awesome. Was that the one awesome. at Pasad Pasad Pasadena? No, no, we actually did all this in Houston. Um, oh. In uh, Space City, as they call it. Still, a, still very envious. Mm. It was awesome. Green with jealousy. It didn't work out, but uh, it was still the most exciting thing I've done probably in my career to date. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean uh, to. But they, they, they also had those water bear things, um, which went up on the mm -hmm. space shuttle. Yeah, so these right. are like little... Um, I don't know they, the I'm sorry, they took water beds on the space shuttle? W water Tardic bears. They're, they're tardigrades. They're, they're little microscopic... Um, animals and they they froze on or presumably froze on the up, uh, on the outside of the space shuttle um, and they survived going up into space frozen there for presumably about a week or two and then uh, defrosted when they came back down and survived yeah they can survive in a vacuum they freeze because they got a lot of these um, cry protectorants in them, which makes them fairly resilient to that sort of thing. Um, but I don't know what sort of bug they are. What do they do? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I think they're free livers, aren't they? I mean, they... Well, whilst you're con contemplating that, let's go back to our caller uh, after image. Does it differ much between whether we meet intelligent life, where we, which seem to be most the topic of conversation, or whether it's microbial? Um, like, for instance, because you said that um, Mars probably has a chance, good chance of microbial life, or, or at least signs of it. Yeah, you know, if we discover other signs that it was once alive in Mars, or or um, is even now alive in, in special pockets um, or something like that because it is fairly resilient. Does that make any difference to, like, does, is microbial something that's a lot easier to marginalize from a religious point and think, oh, well, you know, it's just microbial, it doesn't matter? Or is, do you think there are people who go, wait, well, there's life from other places? That makes me think. 
I don't know, Seth, uh, help us out here if you can. Um, You're kidding this, me. No, I'm asking you. I'm uh, supposed to a, speak about microbial life on other planets? Are you, no, are you about kidding? The, about the Bible, um, because my understanding is that the uh, majority of Christians uh, believe that only humans get to heaven, not animals. So the, 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 uh, the God that they believe in obviously makes some distinction between us and animals. Is that right? Like, like where, where would that fit in Genesis, for example? I mean, Genesis doesn't describe he created the animals. Oh, and he also created some on, you know, Alpha Centauri 7. Would that you think just, people would care? This is just an attempt to get me into the conversation, so I don't feel left out. <laughs> oh no, 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 I, I, I understand. I, I, I know how it is. I, I can do better than this, Seth. Um, um, yeah. So th this is one of the things that always bugged me um, is that you know before uh, the fall of man, there was meant to be no disease, which means that things like. Um, or whatever, syphilis and smallpox um, were around, but they didn't kill people. So how did the fall of man create all of these viruses and bacteria um, that would kill people? I'll do you one better. I was at the Creation Museum a few months ago. And, of course, you go through Ken Ham's Guilt Emporium, which is essentially what it is. It... It posits that everything wrong with the world, including weeds, there's a, a display that shows Adam having to till work the earth because after the fall of man, weeds begin to grow from the ground and dinosaurs became carnivorous. They used to be these harmless, happy plant eating dinosaurs. But no, after the eating of the fruit, no, no, now they begin to eat flesh, and they have a display where the dinosaurs are chewing on each other. I mean, it's, it's absolutely laughable. Where believers often fall in, in terms of, is there life out there, is that they believe that we are the center of all things. In fact, I, I did, produced a video with that very title called The Center of All Things, where it talked about we used to look up at the stars and we used to think that we were, the universe revolved around us. And in truth, there is a real beauty in realizing that it does not. In fact, the universe does not care if we exist. But knowing our place in the cosmos is actually a wondrous and beautiful thing. In the Bible, it says that Adam was given dominion over all of the animals. And I take that to mean dominion over all life, the whole planet, this and that. And... Um, the Bible doesn't really speak to, is there other life out there? It doesn't really deal with it. But I think the implication of there being life elsewhere, let's say there was intelligent life elsewhere. Well, does that mean that there was a Christ figure who had to go to another planet <laughs> whenever they fell or did something wrong? Was there, is there a whole, is there a completely, it's like an alternate salvation story, a parallel thing yeah. going on somewhere? It's uh, kind I, of an I, odd I, concept. I like that. After Jesus got crucified in, in Jerusalem, first of all, he went to America. So he would create <laughs> yeah, a Mormon religion. Right. And, and then he went to beat us in Shuri. Where, where I, he I know a guy. To the Relacrians and... He wrote a uh, Christian fiction book, or he was like a, a, a self-published thing. This was years ago. I don't know if he finished it, but he was writing it at the time, and it was an alternate Adam and Eve story. Yes, we were not the only ones in the universe. There was another Earth-like planet, and there were people on it. And uh, what would happen if they had free will? And would God have to then create an act of human sacrifice, atonement for sin on this other planet. And, of course, it draws a circle around the whole thing. Like, well, you know, how many shots does he need before he gets it right? Hell, he made man flawed. He sticks the, the enchanted tree right in front of him and then blames him for being curious as to what it is and what it does. Then he floods the planet and drowns everybody. And then he has to send his son to be executed. I mean, how many shots are we going to give this omnipotent God? Absolutely. It seems to me like... I, I, I think it was Dark Matter's latest video was absolutely hilarious like that, where, or was it Jeffrey um, puts the tree of the knowledge of good and evil on the top of a really high mountain, makes the fruit taste really bad, makes the tree really tall. What else does he do, Dark Matter? Yeah, um, <laughs> I think that's about it. He, but, you know, of course, in the in the Bible, it says that the tree was in the midst of the garden, and the fruit was good for eating. Uh, you know, and 
Didn't he make it stink? Didn't the fruit smell bad? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, Jeffrey made the fruit smell bad. He did everything he could to make it. I, ha- I have to ask one question, if I may, Doc. Um, Jeffrey is just such a perfect name. Did did you come up with that? Uh, it was a moment of inspiration if you did. It's just so funny. Yeah, I just wanted a you know a mundane name for the angel. <laughs> I mean, it's not like Eve just did it. I mean, God even allowed the serpent to tempt Eve to talk her up a little bit, you know, to say, hey, uh, you know, come on, it's going to be our... He allowed all of these things to trip them up and then blame them. Uh, can you hear my dog? Uh, blame them because, uh, because they were tempted and succumbed as flawed, fallible humans. It's really, a, it's a setup. Well, I, what, I, I, what I don't get, Seth, is this. Um, having, as you say, designed this creation with inherent flaws within it um, it was inevitable something was going to go wrong he then subsequently condemns all of mankind thereafter as a result of Eve eating fruit what sort of God is this <laughs> I mean seriously I mean actually no, come no, on, help a- me here Seth because there was a time Obviously, when you believe this, I mean, and, and I'm not criticizing you for not questioning this. No, you it are. Seems, it I seems am. a madness. No, I'm trying to understand how it was that this didn't sort of like register. Well, well we are taught as believers that, that that downfall is a symptom of the larger problem, that we are flawed, sinful people, that we are born with this sin nature, that the eating of the fruit... We we don't they don't teach it from the uh, necessarily from the perspective of well it was just a fruit, uh, and it was eaten so you deserve eternal torment. They they paint it in the larger context of this is really indicative of a flawed sin nature that that you have and because you are broken you must now be fixed. That's how they play it anyway. But we are created in God's image. Well, you can't well, have it both ways, can you? I'm working on a video concept. You know, I almost want to tap Dark Matter on the on the shoulder, but because his visual style would be perfect for this. But but I'm doing like a you know they they say that Adam was created in God's image, which of course obviously brings up the question: Well, well, why would an omnipotent deity floating in the void of space require two eyes, two ears, a nose, mouth, two arms, two legs, and a penis? I don't. I don't get that. I'm missing something. Bravo! I, I've, <laughs> I've tinkered with that idea. I, I mean, it, it's... Um, but, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you've got, got an animated concept. Why, <laughs> why so. do you need... Yeah, legs, legs are to get you around. Why do you need those if you're omnipotent? And why He's do you need reproductive organs? And he has all of these accoutrements, all of these useful things for living on planet Earth. I, I myself don't get it, but I'm I working on the video they, concept. I they will tell you. Last... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no. I was just going to say they were. They would tell you that that's metaphorical. I'm sure. Um, yeah, they're made in his image cool. in the sense that that people can perceive good and evil, right? Or, or right, right. They have a moral goodness or a soul or whatever. That I think that's how the the more um, Actually, one, of, one, of the, one of the verses in Genesis that I've never been able to understand, uh, and again, Seth, you'll be able to correct me because I'll misquote it, but God, um, I think it's actually Genesis 2, it's sort of like the second um, account of creation. Uh, God says that um, we, we made man and woman, woman in God's image or something like that. So what is what sexuality is God? Is he a man and a woman? Um, who is he talking to when he says we? Uh, you got me. Here's an even better one. And, and Meg, who's a co-admin at The Thinking Atheist, wrote a great blog, which you can find at thethinkingatheist.com, on the character of Lilith, who is part of the Adam and Eve story or the creation story as far as um, uh, it's not written about in the scriptures that were canonized, but there is there was actually a... A female character in the Garden of Eden before Eve, and her name was Lilith. And Lilith was this sexually liberated, strong character. And she wanted to have sex on top. I'm not making this up. And because because she was because she was sexually uh, took the initiative, and because she was bold, she was ostracized and kicked out of the garden. And God reset and created Eve. 
And you should read the blog. It's much too complex for me to cover here. I'd never heard of such a thing in my life, but she documents it. And, of course, the Christians who hear this are just aghast. <laughs> and it tells you something about the culture. I mean, a woman who shows sexual initiative in that, in that era, well, of course she should be ostracized and kicked out immediately. It should be the man who does it all. Uh, I personally, I'm I'm a fan of Lilith. I I think yeah, good for her. She was about two thousand. I, I was about top. to say um, I I don't think many guys would. Um, I don't think many guys object when women take the initiative like that. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just well, I, I just let me let me put one quick point in. Uh, I'm just pulling it up on Wikipedia here, but Lilith was a female demon, a seductress in the Mesopotamian Ooh. religion. So it's an obviously syncretion uh, of prior beliefs, and they're probably a way of uh, stealing the thunder away from the Mesopotamian, you know, how they did that in, in, in ancient um, Hebrew, is they would turn you know, Baal into Baalzebul and turn it into a, a demon in the Christian religion. So it's an obvious syncretism. Plagiarism is probably a hallmark of the Christian all scriptures. All religions, yeah, yeah, probably all of them. Yeah. Well, That's I mean... I said this earlier, but you know, the ultimate plagiarism is there is only one God, and then just adding the extra line and Allah, uh, and Muhammad is his messenger. <laughs> uh, uh, how uninventive can you get? Yeah, you know, to just tag your religion onto someone else's. But anyway, coming briefly back to the um, uh, God makes man in his own image. Um, I remember now some of the r rough stuff that I had um, put out years ago. And it, it, the reasoning went along these lines, you know, first of all, why would God need a mouth to sort of squeeze stuff in and an asshole to squeeze stuff out of? But also, you, you, this, this is going kind of back to the Venom Fang X days when he would make arguments like, God is infinitely just and therefore yeah, any minor transgression were, warrants infinite punishment or reasoning along those lines. And so the thought process came along, well, if God is you know, like man and he's infinite in size well anything times infinity is infinity which means that god is an infinite asshole <laughs> hey can i speak to the plagiaristic tendencies very quickly this is not just true in terms of religious scriptures it's true in it's very true in terms of uh in my experience the christian culture and here's here's my experience in a nutshell I spent a decade as a Christian broadcaster. I was KXOJ 100.9 FM as host of their morning show for most of that decade. And the, the industry used to be these mom and pop bands. It was called contemporary Christian music, meaning that in the late 60s and 70s, they finally got away a little bit from church organs and pianos. And they began to do what rock and pop music was doing at the time, right? They were well behind the pop scene, but they were... They, were, they thought, hey, this is popular music. We're going to create a godly version of it. And that gave birth to Larry Norman and other rockers, the Resurrection Band, Petra, whatnot. And in the Christian music industry, everything that we played on the radio was a direct plagiarism of what was popular on pop radio. It's usually about six months to a year behind. Uh, a great example was uh, the song We Are the World, which was a USA for Africa uh, multi-artist anthem that was done in the uh, 80s. Michael Jackson and Quincy Jones and all those people put it together, and they raised tens of millions of dollars to aid Africa. And within a few months, Christian Music got all of its artists together. They put them all in a studio and did the very same type of song and released it the very same way. We had artists that looked like pop and secular artists. We had artists that sounded like pop and secular artists. We are uh, essentially, the church was trying to find out what's hot. What are people buying in the marketplace? Let's do that. And plagiarism seems to be one of the hallmarks of the church even today. Yeah, I mean, it's also, um, I think, one of the easiest ways, if all you're interested in is, um, you know, just generating traffic, you just leech on whatever's popular. You take a look around what's popular. And you no, just, look, like, you take a love story and you take out the word baby and you stuck, stick in Jesus and you've got a Christian rock song, right? Yeah. Well, in uh, radio, for, we used to call them... Uh, we used to call them God or girlfriend songs. They were popular in the 90s where they could be either. They talk about love, 
but it could be love up or love out, you know, and, and that way that was what they called a crossover hit. They wanted the pop radio stations to pick them up. That explains songs like Amy Grant's Baby Baby and Everything Changes by Kathy Tricoli and many others. They were desperate to be recognized in the pop marketplace. But, you know, Christianity doesn't have a lot new to offer, so it takes the temperature of what people are responding to. What are they wearing? It, you know, they'll, they'll dress their pastors and youth pastors and band members and the types of clothing that are hot and it's it's ultimately they they're just echoing what they've already seen done elsewhere sooner and often better sorry did you say you had a, a, some kind of creationist on a couple of weeks ago we had two we had uh, Rolf Lamper who is the head of the Swedish creationist association and his son Samuel what are the uh, studying changes? for biochemistry what, what are the exchanges school. like? Uh, are you talk? Is it bouncing off? Is there any dialogue, or is it mostly well, you let the, you let them you give them enough rope to hang themselves? So to well, say. I think this work? is an interesting question, and, and let, let's move on to this um, point. Um, what what is the purpose of uh, having someone like that on the show? Well, for me, there are a couple of reasons. Firstly, it uh, gets rid of the criticism that we have that we never get. Um, any theists on the show uh, and secondly I think it, it serves some purpose in exposing the weaknesses of their arguments now um, it's extraordinary no, I love it. and we have uh, Seit and uh, Tenbruggen Kate on um, and Eric uh, I think about March of this year and then we had um, Rolf and Samuel um, later on we got very mixed feelings. Some people enjoyed the show, other people thought we were just uh, ridiculous to have them on and it was a waste of time. So in a way you can't win. But I think that it would be disingenuous of us to uh, continually present a show in which we did not allow uh, conflicting contrary arguments to be put forward to. Uh, well, I enjoy it. I, I, I also I, must say this is something that I've uh, meant to mention when I read out the list at the very beginning of those that we have had on the show. There's a couple of people that we have invited who have not got back to us, and we would love to have them on the show, and they are William Lane Craig, Ray Comfort, and Ken Ham. All of them have been sent invitations uh, to appear on the show. Not one of them has got back to us. So, I mean, are we to be criticised for inviting people on. I mean, this is another point, isn't it? When when you do get a theist on, um, the, the criticism you will face potentially from other theists is, oh, well, they're not representative of what my views are. They're not real Christians. But Sometimes those people are a gift. I, I did a, a podcast. I was a guest on someone else's podcast a month ago, and he is a hardcore Pentecostal. He believes in signs and visions and and speaking in tongues and all of these things. And so he wanted to do a, uh, wanted me to be a guest on his show. And I agreed under the condition that it would be played in its entirety and unedited, and I would be able to record it on my end and then play it for my audience. And under, this is a problem. And then you guys have borne witness to the fact that many times when you debate a theist for their particular shows, then you are taken into the editing room and unfairly sliced to pieces. And um, so anyway, I... You know, I, we had a, about a 90-minute conversation, and no one was shouting, nobody interrupted. But listening to him speak and having tens of thousands of listeners hear him speak helped free thought. <laughs> it helped rationalism. It helped atheism. The more he spoke, the more ridiculous his points became. And it was, it, those types of people are quite often, I think, a gift to uh, the secular movement. That, that was our experience with the Lambas and, and with Eric Hoban and Seitz and Bruggenkate. It, it really wasn't the counter arguments because we had no intention. We never had the intention of changing the person's mind. The point is to have the ideas and hash them out and evaluate. Let, let people watching evaluate the arguments and contrast them and see which side it is that is presenting data that has rational reasonable arguments and which one eventually resorts to this sort of silliness these nonsensical positions or did Cy, evasion. Cake, did Cy give you that kind of that well you know I, you know I, I 
I, you can't be expected to understand what I'm trying to tell you because you you are not a believer and therefore do not have the Holy... I mean, did, did he give you that song and dance? Because I just wanted to reach through and just slap the guy. <laughs> yeah, he gave us the tag argument. I mean, that's that's why we, we brought him on, is was shopping it around at the Reason Rally, and we wanted to bring him on and give him a chance. We wanted everyone to hear it at one time yeah. and go through the refutations of it, basically, to give him a chance uh, to immunize everyone watching the show against that particular argument the next time they're ambushed on the street, they'll be better prepared. Um, and I think it's, it's worth hearing those things in advance. Uh, even if they're frustrating or annoying, they'll be a hell of a lot more frustrating or annoying if someone pops them on you at a party or corners you uh, at, at dinner sometime and some acquaintance of yours thinks this is the most amazing argument ever, you will have formulated a response to that. Uh, and I think that's that's worth worthwhile. Well, the smug, uh, superior mannequin stares of the presuppositionalists make me... I mean, just the, the word presupposing... Yeah. ...is, yeah. is, Gives is it the away, antithesis. It? Oh, it's the antithesis well, of what rational living should be. I want to go yes. to Dark. Sorry, I want to go, it's, it's, please, I want to go to Dark on this because Dark um, is, okay. despite his um, modesty, he's he's very good on philosophical arguments. Um, what's well, your view I'm, on presuppositionalism? I'm sorry, but concor nothing concordant in, concordant says really matters, seeing as how he doesn't know if somebody's controlling his mind. <laughs> so sorry, man. <laughs> You need the Holy Spirit to understand it, and of course, you have yes, to. Uh, it, it, <laughs> yeah. Where, whereas, of course, everything that Sai says is completely valid because he, everything he's saying might be being controlled by his supernatural being. The voices yeah. in his head told him so is essentially what he's telling us. But, right. I mean, for me, it's, it's for worse than that, actually. What he says is, and I asked him this many times when he was on the program, and the answer was always, always the same. How do you know that you've got it right and um, other people have not? And his only answer was, it has been revealed to me in such a way so that I know it is true. Hmm. How do you deal well, with that yeah, argument? Well, look, look, I mean, I, I think that all deals are off when your proof of God is, if I assume that God exists, then I've proved that God exists. I mean, we, we, it's, you know, it's the presupposition is that God exists. Yeah. Well, um, okay, um, let's see if we can substitute anything else in there and come to the conclusion that exists. Let's say presuppose that the flying spaghetti monster exists, therefore the flying spaghetti monster exists. Not a terribly convincing argument. Well, and we cover often that anecdotal evidence is not really evidence. I had a personal experience. The voice is telling me, I, it has been revealed to me personally, is no more credible than someone who had had a visit from his spirit animal or who had seen, you know, had visions of Elvis or little green men or, you know, something else. I mean, we, I'm, I'm going to need more. And then they come at me with, and Cy was guilty of this. It's, well, you're not going to be able to understand the concept of God because you are unsaved. But the, the salvation message is in Scripture. I, the unsaved, now cannot properly understand God's scriptural message which is required for me to get saved so that I can understand God's scriptural message. It's this weird sort of black hole that you fall into if you follow that line of reasoning. Well, now, that's actually, actually uh, part of his belief. He's Presbyterian, and, and they do believe in predestination. And that is that God will grant you the ability to understand God's message if you are predestined. Uh, so, that, I mean, that's, that's part of his specific theology. I don't that's think Eric has the same theology. That's even worse. That that means that why bother going on mission trips? Why right. bother having evangelical sermons? It is predetermined who will be saved. Well, I, I won't. I won't go into. It. I was raised Presbyterian, so I, I, in my confirmation class, that was something that that we went through. Um, and of course, the argument makes perfect sense at the time, uh, until you start really poking holes at it. And if you're unafraid to poke holes in it, it it's 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 a bit silly. Yeah, I mean, Time travel. It's a looper. 
For me, um, you know, one of the great uh, parodies of it is The Ghost That Never Lies. You know, if The Ghost That Never Lies exists and he tells me The Ghost That Never Lies is real, can I trust with 100% certainty that The Ghost That Never Lies exists? <laughs> um, I'm going to be laying in bed tonight looking at the ceiling thinking about that. Be like, <laughs> just can't process it. <laughs> And if the ghost that never lies then tells me that your god doesn't exist, does your god then cease to exist? Yeah, I, I need, need, I need, I need an adult you beverage, know, people. It's a, it's actually, you know, if you think about all the other religions that where people have had divine revelations that have conflicted with other people's divine revelations, I mean, it makes perfect sense. It does. All right, oh, I'm, let's, let's I'm move talking on. about, you know what I'm talking about. Of course. Um, let's move on then, uh, Dark. Let me take your views on this, because it's not one I'm entirely sure that you've um, made a video on, on particularly your Dark Antics channel, uh, but it's one that has cropped up uh, many times over 2012 on the show, and that is the idea of whether it, there is such a thing as objective morality. Um... <clears throat> That's, uh, you know, a lot more complex than it would seem on the surface. I, I think that, um, all right, it, human uh, life in general, I mean, it's an objective fact that it can be, it can flourish or it can be destroyed. And if we decide that it's, you know, better for uh, for human beings to, to flourish and, and, to, and to be benefited rather than for harm to come to us. That's about as close to objective as we can be. And I think a significant moral basis can be drawn from that in that if we can provide evidence for a moral action, which we're debating about, that it will be a benefit. If we can provide evidence that will be more beneficial than harmful, then I think we can call that a, a morally good thing, and and be safe in our in our assertion. Yeah, that it's and, and 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 in using that de uh, definition or that description, you are obviously relying, um, so far as I understand, on what uh, Sam Harris's argument is. But uh, my understanding is that Sam Harris's argument is totally different to, for example, William Lane Craig. William Lane Craig thinks that objective morality seems to be floating around in the ether. Uh, given to us um, mm -hmm. by a god. Now, in, in, if that's the definition of objective morality, can you see any possible reason to support that argument? Because I cannot. I mean, it's, it's, it's not really objective at all, then. It's up to the whim of this, this other mind, this, this god's mind, you know, and it, it, he's been appointed as the one who gets to define what is moral. So, you know, in we can see from the Bible, you know, if the Bible is true, that he uh, he he's a do as I say, not as I do type of guy. And you know, you lead by example. At least you should. He doesn't do that. Why doesn't God lead by example? Why is why is he you know wiping out the earth with a flood or why, why isn't he trying to instead of helping someone understand why they shouldn't commit evil acts and and, and giving them insight uh, why, why is he just wiping them out or letting them do whatever they want to do or you know you know, we like to say free he, will, but he wipes he wipes them out in a genocide, a genocide that is beyond all genocides that we've ever known, and then uh, issues commandments that you shan't kill. Very odd thunder. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, um, it's easiest to explain these things if you actually move it on to something that is much more easily quantifiable, like height or weight. And let's take height as the more simpler of the examples. Um, if you come across someone who is um, 12 foot 6 tall, are they tall or short? And is that a really objective measure? 
are, are they objectively tall or not? Most people say, yeah, they're objectively tall. Um, but in reality, you're just measuring it versus a population, right? In what? Why should you actually, uh, if you're measuring them versus, say, the height of, I don't know, the Eiffel Tower, they're very short. But you don't. You measure them versus um, the on the the, the the population. There is an average height for the population. Sure, there's a spread of of heights. Um, but you know, once you get into whatever the one or two percent extremes, you you call them objectively tall, even though it's only measured relative to a population. And the same thing so true in morality that. Um, uh, there, there is an ensemble behaviour um, that will form on that will fall on something that looks like a bell curve, and it's the people on the extremes are what we call extremely good and extremely evil, and everyone else is more or less in the middle. Um, and some of those uh, uh, curves are, are much more plastic than others. So, for instance, you get things like, is killing good or bad? Um, well, uh, it, you know, it's very heavily biased to killing is bad. Um, but even at that, you can... Um, has everyone here seen the film Watchmen? Yeah. yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, I mean, so the end of Watchmen um, does... Ozymandias, right? So Ozymandias basically decides that in order to, he's the smartest man on the planet, he knows with absolute certainty that if he kills um, uh, 20 million people, that he will save the entire planet from nuclear Armageddon. Uh, did he make the right decision? And if you're laid out with those exact choices of murdering, uh, choosing to murder 20 million or having the death of six billion um, as the default option, then it, it's obvious you, you you kill the twenty million. Um, now, did 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 killing people just become morally acceptable, or you know? That's the speaks to the very first argument I've made on my Dark Antics channel is that. According to Christianity, according to Jesus Christ, only a few people, the few are going to, you know, be saved. The vast majority aren't. So, is it justifiable? I mean, is Christianity, the, the system, justifiable? We're talking about sacrificing the majority for the benefit of the few. And I'd say no. That's immoral. The opposite is true. Uh, yeah. Um, but, but, I mean... I I would actually love to actually hear what someone like Craig's response would be to the Ozymandias dilemma. I mean, we, actually, uh, Dark Matter, were you saying that um, what Ozymandias did, was it right or wrong? Um, what I say is that if you know, you know, six billion or seven billion people are going to die and the only way to save them is to kill 20 million people then you i mean you have to there's no choice otherwise seven billion people are going to die what's worse seven billion or 20 million i mean yeah. to me i have to say this sounds just like a um, variation of the trolley problem but um i have to say on that note i am going to start trying to bring things up can i go back first to the caller and thank him very much for his patience uh, I hope, to a degree, that we managed to answer your questions, and thank you very much for the call. Wow, we've overrun by an hour and ten minutes. Um, so, let's see if we can wrap it up. Firstly, by me giving thanks to um, all of the people that have appeared on the show, in particular the last two that are still with us, Dark Matter 2525 and The Thinking Atheist. Thoughts for 2013? What are your hopes, desires, aspirations, etc.? Um, we'll start with the um, Thunder Concordance and we'll go on to our special guests. Thunder, th 2013. Um, 2013. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a good year. Okay, that's the briefest he's ever been. Thank you. Concordance. <laughs> 
Uh, well, so I've, uh, you, some of you may have noticed that I haven't made videos in a long time. Uh, I'm going to get back in the saddle. I've, I've had some more stuff. There's a lot of exciting stuff going on scientifically in my life. I'm going to actually start talking a little bit more now that uh, a colleague of mine has, has discovered who I am. Uh, the secret is that I feel like I can talk a little bit more about my work. Uh, I'm going to do a series on uh, fallacies. Uh, that I think would would help in terms of critical thinking, um, and, and the the one thing I, I want to make a prediction about is that this year will be a very big year for um, Mormon issues, uh, and I'd like you all to keep an eye out on the fundamentalist um, uh, Latter Day Saints group, uh, which apparently are preparing for some sort of a an end of the world event. Uh, they're a group that are known to be uh, both violent and self-destructive. So keep an eye out on what's going to happen there. It's a, it's a bit troubling. Um, and then on a positive note, uh, 2012 has been a, a great year for, for me, uh, and I'm looking forward to what the next year will hold. Thank you very much. Um, Dark Matter, let's go to you next. Um, I'm not sure what... 2013 will hold. I hope that it's a good year and I hope the economy improves and um, glad to see that the world didn't end uh, what never expected it to. Th that's the funny thing about those prophecies is uh, I mean it's one thing that we know is going to happen eventually. It's just yeah. <laughs> it's funny to see the, 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 all the predictions come and go it's gonna happen no doubt about it and it comes and goes but anyway well, that was funny we all expected that to come and go and nothing to happen i'm sure actually, just just and, so you know i was actually thinking of making a completely pseudo science video with lots of jargon and gobbledygook um and graphs showing that the world will end and the only way that people can actually stop the world from ending is to buy t-shirts with special little codes in them and when you distribute <laughs> them around the world it'll it'll prolong the end of the world so the only way you can stop the end of the world is to buy t-shirts well i was in a uh, discussion on another program uh, recently and the end of the world predictions uh, came up and I said I hadn't checked it out but I said I'm sure the next end of the world prediction won't be that far away. I did look it up I don't have time to do it now but I can assure you it is somewhere around the 21st of May. It is a prediction made by someone who is a Christian and who has made previous uh, predictions in uh, 2009 and 2010, but he now realizes he got his sums wrong, and it's actually 2013, around the 21st, 23rd of May sort of time. So that's the next one we have to look forward to. Uh, ah. Seth, finally you. Um, your, your hopes, aspirations for 2013. Well, my personal plan is to wait to see what Concordance, Thunder, Dark Matter, and you put out so that I can then plagiarize your ideas and and use them for myself i mean i'm uh you know <laughs> why well, i come up with an original idea repurpose seth <laughs> it's, um creatively I, repurpose the ideas i have made a commitment for 2013 personally to have a little more of a measure of balance in and and all of you as producers may know the maintaining i mean the 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 thinking atheist community is is near and dear to my heart i i they are a part of me i i need them and um and it's an amazing privilege to be a part of it but i have found that as a single individual over the course of the last three some years non-stop it's unsustainable and uh and i just got engaged i'm i'm i have a family you know i have all i have a life i have all these things i want to do i think for 2013 you will that's probably very Seth, that's very selfish of you, you know. I, and it is, it is, uh, and I'll admit that it's selfish. I, I want to be able to have a uh, life. I'm, I'm kidding. And uh, so I, I, my hope is, is that, is that I'm able to maybe bring in uh, some key people, maybe some people who are have specific gifts who can help me sort of carry the load, and then perhaps make contributions far beyond what I myself have been able to make and, and who knows what, how it will evolve. And it's going to be an interesting sort of experiment to see what happens in the coming months and years. But I'm very excited about 2013 and, 
and uh, I have I've certainly have high hopes for uh, for this community and for all of yours as well. And I will finish on my aspirations. I hope to be able to get to the Atheist Convention in Texas in March, which will give me an opportunity, I hope, um, to meet um, all of you, um, including people I've never met before. I know I've met you, Seth. Um, I'd love to meet you again. Dark Matter, I'm hoping there'll be an opportunity to meet you as well, and also you, Concordance. So that's that's what I'm looking forward to in 2013. But I'm going to end the show now. I have to. We've overrun by, as I say, an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, can I just finish by thanking everyone uh, for uh, watching Great the show, show for turning up, um, for all of those who have appeared on the show, and also uh, I have to give a huge thank out to two people who work away wonderfully behind the scenes um, and have done a wonderful job in 2012 on very few occasions have we um, lost uh, connection or the program has broken down which um, was not what happened in previous years and uh, the thanks go to Tony and Ben uh, particularly Tony who works um, so regularly bringing this show to you uh, so huge thanks to Tony I wish everyone a very happy new year uh, we will be back on the 6th uh, I'm not entirely sure whether I will be able to make it on that date, but um, the show will go on uh, without me, which I'm sure for a lot of people will be a good thing. But on that bombshell, uh, please, thumbs up everyone uh, for all our special guests that have turned up. Um, we will try for next year to get uh, some more interesting hosts on as well. Uh, Seth has uh, already agreed to uh, appear. I'm sure we'll be able to persuade Dark Matter. David Silverman has agreed to appear. Um, and also Phil Moriarty. So there's uh, another four special guests to look forward to in the coming year. Uh, thank you all very much indeed on that bombshell. Hopefully Tony is around. I know that he was going off to watch a uh, football game on the television. I hope he's still around so he can actually press the end show button. Otherwise, we could be stuck here for some time. On that bombshell, thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>